Hey, what's up, everybody? We're live. Here we I did it. I did it. <laughs> all right. So yeah, this was uh this was some day, man, figuring all this stuff out. Uh welcome to an epi another episode of uh Police Off the Cuff After Hours. Uh my name is Mark DeMayo. I'm your host. Bill is on a vacation tonight uh with his family. We hope that he's having a wonderful time. I've seen some pictures. He looks like he's having a great time. Uh so he has to, I asked um I was thinking of who I could get in to get a, to be a co-host, and uh, I'm a big fan of our our co-host tonight. He's got his own podcast. It's called Mike in New Haven. He's a what I call a prodigy, and, uh, <laughs> and we're very very happy to have him. What's up, Mike? How are you? I'm doing good. I wouldn't go as far as calling myself a prodigy. If you really <laughs> knew me, you wouldn't say that. But yes, I'm very honored to be here. Big fan of the podcast, and uh, what blast this is going to be. Yeah, and uh, this this uh, this is a special episode because I haven't seen um, my friend here. I think it's twenty nine years um, in person. Maybe we we bumped into each other once. I don't know. Maybe. But uh, thank God for social media, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. We, we, uh, we went to the police academy together. We were part of the largest um, a group of uh, recruits yeah. getting sworn in in Brooklyn Tech. And uh, and at Madison Square Garden, where we graduated, uh, I think it was a little less than three thousand. Yeah. Uh, and it, this go go figure, we were in the same company together. So we went through the academy together in Company ninety two fifty five. He went on to be a, a, a detective with the NYPD. He worked in narcotics. He was actually a, a canine uh, detective, and uh, he's here with us tonight. What's up, Paul Zito? How are you? What's going on, Mark? How are you, buddy? Mike, how are you? Doing well, man. Can't complain. All right. It's really good to see you, man. I'm very excited, brother. I mean, I've seen you doing your comedy skits and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm a follower of you and, and I'm, I am watch the show all the time. And, uh, and I can't believe you asked me to come on because, uh, I mean, you have some big detectives on here. I mean, some case solvers, some, some big guys. And me, I mean, I, mean I, I'm, I was your buddy in the academy, but I mean, I was almost like your bestie in the academy, man. Yeah, I, I could say if there was uh, there was three of us. It was me, you, and I, I can't even. J J what was his name? Uh, <laughs> oh man, if we have to we're start both, back, we're both bad with our uh, with the yeah guys. the guys. It was pretty much the three three of us. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a good company. Yeah, you know? and uh, when, when we look back to the academy, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, Mike. Uh, it's it's like. Um, it's like you're back in high school. Mm. You know, it doesn't take long, you know, because you're talking about all young guys too. Young, not young. When I say guys, I mean men and women, right. uh, young people, young adults. And uh, even though I was probably one of the older people because I was 25, how old were you? 21. 21. And, Just started, uh, yeah. What were you doing be prior to come going into the, the police academy? Oh, shit. Uh, I was doing like security gigs left and right. Actually, my father got me into a security gig and I was doing it for American Express. I was doing construction on the side. I was going to college, you know, I was into my second year of college and, you know, I happened to take the test and everything and it just happened to just pop up and I'm like, I can't do this crap no more. This, this running back and forth construction and back and forth. So, uh, yeah, when they, when they, when they called me, I was like, I, my father, it was like, I had, his head went up in the air. He was like, I can't believe it. You got in. <laughs> um, and you know, like uh, it's just like it's just like in school, you mm -hmm. gravitate towards yeah. people that are like you. And right off the bat, I found Paul. Uh, there was a couple other, uh, you know, and everybody was cool in the company, but we were like a clique. And uh, yeah. we all, we all, we smoke cigarettes. Now this is gonna. Can you imagine this, Mike? Well, I want to show you something now, because right now the academy right now is in uh, College Point, Queens. But this is where the academy was when we went. Yeah. Right okay. in, the, in the middle of, uh, uh, that was, that's uh, 20th Street. 20th Street in uh, Manhattan. Yeah, between wow. uh, between 2nd okay. and 3rd. And uh, we used to, uh, this is the gym floor. If you look in the background, you could see people running. We used to have to run. Um, <laughs> we used to, they used to make us do a mile and a half in that. Yeah. Jim, and it, that meant it was 27 times around. Wow. And Paul was in phenomenal shape. I was a, a well, hold on, you dude, you were in great shape, not for nothing. There was we had the company shirts, 
It said 92.55. It looked like an extra medium on you because your chest was out <laughs> here. It had 92 on one peck and 55 on the other peck. <laughs> then the shorts that they gave us were like a dollar three eighty. They were like the worst shorts ever. You couldn't get them in a five dollar store. That's how. How, short, how short were they? I, they were so short. I, I think I saw your nuts hanging out in one shot, <laughs> and your quads were just exploding out of them. And every step you took, you saw the muscles in your quads like flexing. I'm like, damn, this guy got to keep up with this guy. Yeah, he, he was the tallest guy in the whole. I think on a whole academy class. And I've been told. I've been told by mutual friends of ours, he's a giant. Yeah. What are you, 6'4"? Yeah. And it's yeah, yeah. was like, he I had a perfect, perfect face. When he used to run, he had a perfect quaff. That thing used to be like flowing in the wind. And oh, so did you. So did you. And you know, you could always tell the people that you're going to get along with. And then like, yeah. uh, like you were in good shape too, man. I, yeah. I, you were young. You know what I'm saying? You were hitting the clubs. You know, you were you were in the in, in phenomenal. You're still in good shape. <laughs> You're yeah, still, well, I still try to keep in good shape. You know what I mean. If you, you know, it's it's only when you get older everything starts everything starts falling down on you. You know, so you yeah. gotta keep in shape, whatever. You gotta, stay, you gotta stay on top of it. Right, right. You're not gonna be like that forever, Mike. No, no. Don't turn on Mike right now because you know he's yeah. <laughs> look at the smile on that kid. He's gonna be a star. <laughs> so anyway, so um, you know what I used to like to do in the academy. I used to like to fuck with people because that's what I do. I still do it now. That's my job. And when we used to start the run, we were when we got into the academy. So mind you, there's three thousand recruits, right? So they got to split into A, B, and C companies. We're all coming in at different times. You're working seven days a week. You don't even have steady weekends off. The freaking uh, the gym class was packed. The shower room, oh. <laughs> To, to take a shower, you had to wait in line, and you didn't even want to bring your towel because no. uh, it w it might not be there when you're done. So I would just leave my towel and my just you just walk naked in the um, yeah. you know, and you just wait in line. Pack us in like that. It, it was like a one Mike. It was one squared room, and they they like all right. It was dark, and they go, "This is the shower." You you go to the shower, and it was like thirty of us in the shower. And you and a, you know you have to bring flip flops in there because the shit that you know guys sweat and all that stuff comes out. It was <laughs> it wasn't the greatest place to to shower. I mean, but, I mean, but let me let me ask. I mean, do you think that they did that on purpose to toughen you guys up? Yeah, of course. That way of you guys up. No, what are you gonna do? You're gonna build separate shower heads for everybody. Yeah. No, you just throw them in there like animals. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something, man. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's military places where it's ten times worse than that. You got to shower in a puddle or something like that. But you know. Oh I miss that. I hang out in the shower room at the gym now. <laughs> it's not the same. You know what it's like to see 300 men coming in and out? Oh. Well, you're just massaging your shoulder, winking at everybody. Oh, <laughs> oh, no. Guys used to bend over, pick up their towels. They got, I mean, it was a phenomenal amount of hair. I was in there for 45 minutes one day. I stayed for the B company, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. So, um, is, you know what I used to like to do? I used to like to... Um, like I said, I used to like to fuck with people. So we were the first company. So when we started the run, remember, I'm telling you, oh, yeah. it's monotonous. It's a, a monotonous. It's a gym. Mm -hmm. So you're basically running around, um, you know, 27 times. And mm -hmm. there was people that were going to drop out every day. Every day. They're called run dropouts. You know, yep. they're, they're, they're happy, whatever. Wow. A lot of them just full of shit. They don't want to freaking do it. They go in the middle. They're holding on to their shin. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're trying to. There's some people run out for water. Uh, it's just a whole scam that's going on there, right? But I used to, I used to like to get people out of the run real quick. So as soon as we finished the first lap, I, I used to yell out, 26 more." <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I used to yell yeah. out, and then all of a sudden he said, "Trickle in." By the time I said 24, there was like six of us running. Yeah, you had to hear when somebody would yell that out, they'd be like, oh, it was like a crowd. You heard, oh, you know. used to come in there hungover, do that run first oh. thing in the morning. Yeah. It was beautiful. Yo, but remember, remember, Mark, there was some times where they changed our schedule up that you had lunch first and they would rip us back into the gym. Yeah, so that, that was, that was the worst time. You'd go to the diner and whatever, eat like a big meal or something. You were running 27 times and you were, forget it, the throw-ups that you – it was it was the worst. You see, and you know the thing is, we're kids too, so we're going out. And I remember we'd go out, and uh, as a company, and we yeah. go to these bars. Sometimes we go to Manhattan. Sometimes we would go in Long Island and meet on the weekends. 
And it was a really good bonding thing. But at the same time, we had these tests coming up, these exams. Mm. And sometimes we probably shouldn't have been out. We should have probably been uh, studying. Yeah. What we used to do was we used to quiz each other at the club. <laughs> yeah. We would be drinking and like to do another shot. Be like, All right, so what's this, that, and the other? Yeah. And, then we were, and we would always tell Paul because Paul, oh. you know. <laughs> It, it was it was bad. You know, I used to I used to study with this one guy, and basically he had an apartment, and I was twenty one. I still lived at home. I, I was living home with my parents, I think, and um, he had an apartment. So I used to go to his house, and the guy was a big drinker. So we were drinking forties. I mean, straight up forties. I was drinking a forty of Saint Ides while doing the thing. I was like. We were getting cranked out at the end of, you know, at a half an hour, an hour. And I'm, and I'm like, dude, I can't do this no more. I, I'm a finish. He's like, why are you drinking so much? I said, I'm trying to keep up with you, you know? So <laughs> it was tough. But I, you know, but, but I was never a great, I was a great student. I, yeah, I can admit that. I was, uh, you know, I was just, I got into the academy and I was like, please, God, let me get through this. I just want to make my father happy because he was he's an ex cop. He was, you know, that's his uh kid. We all helped each other though. We all helped yeah, each other. Yeah. We did, we did. And then right good. before the classes, right before the tests, you know, it, it's either we were in the, the cafeteria or something or bullshitting. We would just quiz each other back and forth. And you know who the smart kids were, and you know who the you know the guys who well, would the like the is, is everybody has their own um their own strengths. Yeah. So, like, you could have somebody that, like, okay, they could do the run, this, that, and the other, but maybe they they weren't so good on the schooling, and then you oh, have, maybe yeah. somebody wasn't good at driving, or right. maybe somebody was a bad shot. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, you kind of, sort of help yeah. each other out. Somebody could, you know, not do that great on test, but be a great shot because yeah. they were in the military. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So everybody would help each other out, mm -hmm. and that was, you know, that was uh, that was the good. Like, for example, some people couldn't swim. They throw you in the pool there, and you see like, some of the biggest, you know, the biggest guys in the company, yeah. and they're holding on to the wall. They got the the, the raft around them because yeah. the kids. Oh them boy! Their whole life. Oh my god! Hey, let me let me give a shout out to some of the people that are tuning in right now. Uh, Blondie ten twenty five. Hello, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Ryan Ryan's investigative group. Uh, our, our usual uh, casting crew here: Rachel Pranzo, uh, Raquel Pranzo, uh, Edward uh, Kelly. Peter Pranzo, um, thank you guys for coming. For for uh, you know, this is why Bill does this because I'm horrible at it. <laughs> Mr. Bill, Sandra Rivera is here tonight. She did her walk nine miles. Joanne Blazich, uh, Edward Kelly, thank you guys for tuning in. Our guest tonight, yes, Bill Costa, Ron B, uh, Melody McAtee, Michael McClough. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, our guest tonight is uh, is a friend of mine. We go way back. We went to the we graduated from the police academy together, and uh, then once you got out of the academy, where'd you go? Uh, well, you know what? When, remember when they stuck us in the uh, the room in the academy uh, in one of the <clears> classrooms? <throat> they said, "All right, we're going to give you assignments." So I'm like, "All right, what's the assignment going to be?" Hopefully, the guy that I called up made the phone call and can get me where because mike what you have to do is sometimes you would make a phone call to whoever could help you out to try and get you into a certain precinct or whatever a hook if you will that's the term right, right? Hook. Yes. right. there you go a hook so i made a, I had that hook or whatever and uh we're in the class and then we're in the room and all of a sudden the guy goes uh this guy that guy and everybody's high-fiving everybody they're going yeah man this is gonna be awesome they go zito psa2 housing i was like what Oh, you originally were a housing cop pre-merger. So they were like, "Yeah," and one guy in the back, he was in his, he was an instructor, and he was like, "Yeah, I hope you got two guns there, pal." And I got signed. I was in housing. I was in PSA two in Brooklyn in East New York. So that's between the seven five and the seven three precinct. So I was on Sutter Avenue. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. So just so the audience knows, you're talking about. Um, the three worst precincts in New York City. Right. And you're talking about not just covering the precincts, but covering exactly where they live. Right. Like exactly where a lot of the crime, the, the criminals are coming out of. I mean, it was the most, it was the, from back then, from the 80s into the 90s, the crack craze was out of control. They had the, they had the cracks in the vials. And 
Let me tell you something. The first day I got there, I tried to try to uh, uh, the first day I parked my car, uh, not in the lot where all the cops parked. They firebombed it with Molotov cocktails. So I found out that was going to happen. So I got there late at night. So just to get a locker in the PSA too. So wind up, I, I wind up getting there and, you know, I'm there. I sat in there and we, you know, they, they showed us around and basically, you know, you are a housing cop in, they, they give you a certain area, project area where you would patrol. You could either do Brownsville projects, the Linden projects, the Tilden projects. So it's, you know, it's really, there. there's some tough, tough areas around there. But, you know, also very nice people. I met a lot of very nice people around the neighborhood. Um, but it was it was crazy. I mean, I used to we used to the guys that taught us used to basically tell us, listen, if you want to get a, a drug collar, just run right up towards the front of the door and watch the dealer. So that's what we used to do. So you run up right to the front of the doors and above the doors, there was a, a crease on the top. And this is where they would put their bags of crack. And used to get like 30, 40 vials of crack in, in a bag or whatever. And he used to, you know, that's how they used to whack them out. But um, it was crazy. I, I I mean, I've never seen so much shooting. They when I was a housing cop over there, they said you can't go out in New Year's Eve and Fourth of July. Those are the two times because those two times you wind up getting shot because they let rounds go left and right. They were blowing shotgun rounds, AK-47 rounds. So it was a it was a crazy time. So, but I got to I got to um, to know the place pretty well, and um, I became a, a PCO there in the uh, Marcus Garvey projects. So it was it was nice. It was it was it was it was a fun time. I mean, to start off in a in a in a regular precinct, uh, an easy precinct, you would probably learn how to give out parking summonses and stuff like that. This I started out with drug collars. I mean, I had I had Tech Nine machine gun uh, collars. I had, I mean, I had a, a gun collar in my fifth month there. Uh, it was a Tech 9, a 380, a bulletproof vest, and 20, no, I'm sorry, 12 people under arrest. I had 7375, all the anti crime units come in one shot deal. It was, it was insane. It was insane. And we always got shot in the hallway by, by the whole, by the whole the roundup. So it was crazy. Yeah. So allow me to ask you this. Um, you know, you were essentially a housing cop during the last two raw for housing. Of course, the merger happens in 1995 where transit right. and housing is merged into the NYPD. Right. Some cops liked it because it gave them the chance to advance their careers. Other cops didn't. Were you one of the cops that didn't or did you, were you on board? Absolutely. Uh, Mike, I tell you, the, the, the cops that were there were hardcore, good working cops, and they taught the rookies the right way to do things. I mean, I got taught by some really good guys um, and they sh and they watched you back. I mean, you're in a hardcore place. They watch you back in that place. And uh, I mean, regardless, you had to walk because back then there was no cause for no, uh, for no cops, no rookies. Yeah, you were walking. Yeah. So I had to walk six blocks from the PSA all the way up into whatever project. Or if you're lucky, you get a car that'll drop you off near the project and you would have to walk, you know, three, four blocks to get to the uh, record room where you'd have to sign in. So, but um, it was, it was fun. It was, it was a, it was a lot of learning experience. I mean, I mean, you don't get that, you know, you don't get that experience of working in like a, like a, like a really easy precinct. So I, I, um, I say to guys out there who are going out in the academy and stuff like that, go and get yourself into a, a good precinct because uh, you could advance uh, after that and get the knowledge and stuff like that, you know? Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but um I mean, housing was great. It was, I, I was there. For, I think I was there for like two or when three. When did you find out you were going into housing again? What's that? When did you find out you were going into housing? When we got out of the academy, we were, uh, when we out of the academy, they put us in the room and they, and they told us, you know, hey, listen, this is where you're going, this is where you're going. They said, Zito, you're going to PSA 2 East New York uh, and housing. And I didn't even know what that was. I forgot there was city, housing, and transit. So basically, I got put into the housing. Um, uh, detail or whatever into the precincts and that's it man but it was i tell you i have so many stories that i could go back that would were you, ever, were you ever in a shooting yeah i was in a shooting in the um in this when i worked in the uh after after i got out of housing and i laddled over i went back into the six two precinct the easy precinct in bensonhurst and uh it winds up i i was there for about eight years and um I was doing anti-crime for about four years there. And in one scenario, we had a group of guys 
uh, that were doing uh, robberies. They were robbing Orientals coming off the trains. So I, I uh, me and my partner at the time, we got a tip from someone and we sat on this vehicle they were using for the robberies. So we were in Park Slope. So that 7-2 was letting us sit on this because we got the tip. So we were sitting on below the, uh, on one of the streets on 48th and this was 8th Avenue. So they were on top. We watching the vehicle up on top and finally they got in. So I'm sitting with my partner and we're there and we're going, yeah, what are we having for breakfast? I never, I didn't even eat this area. So we basically sat in the area and all of a sudden I said, oh shit, the fucking car's moving. So the car started taking off. We wind up following it, get it down and made a right turn and hit down on the, uh, in one of the lights. And then from there, we came out, we ran out. My partner wound up going on one side and um, he grabbed the, the driver. The driver had a gun on him. So he pulled him out. And then the, the other dri uh, the, uh, the driver, um, he reversed the car, knocked me down, and then smashed into our crime car. And then my partner uh, let a round go into his car because he had, the, he was, he had a, a steering wheel with the gun on it. So he had it right with him. So he didn't know who was coming up on him. So basically, he came at me, and he tried to cr crush me up against the cars. So I let like three rounds go. He let two rounds go through the windshield. And then my partner was like, he was like, I don't know, Dirty Harry. He was like, <laughs> he let about 13 rounds. I was like, that's it, enough. So there was bullets flying down there, but he hit the he hit the cop a lot. And um, we wound up getting this guy. He ratted the, the guy out and uh, wind up, I think the 7-2 squad found him in like a crack house or something like that. And they grabbed him and. But uh, you know, it was it was that type of this guy. This guy did about ten, uh, no, sixteen robberies at gunpoint. My goodness, oh, you know, yeah. I do want to I do want to ask not to cut you off, Mark. You know, Mark, when you were you were on my show, I asked you about the danger of the job, and what you told me was interesting. You know, when you're young, you don't really think about it. Is your is, was Mark's response to me? So I'll ask you. I mean, uh, after an experience like that, in which I mean, you could have been pinned up against that car, you could have been seriously injured. Did it change your outlook and perception on the dangers of the job? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it does, it does um, a flicker in your head that you can get into an incident, something like that. You know, most of the time, uh, you know, guys are just, you know, they, they have to look out, they have to watch on there. They have to watch every angle that they're, that they're um, in their perspective while working. So, but, but when this happened, it was like, it was like, shit, we're in it. We're in it right now. These guys have guns. These are the guys and we got to grab them. You know what I mean? And when the round started flying, I mean, it was crazy. It winds up, I got the audio to the, um, I think from the, from the, from one police plaza. I got the, I had the audio from it and uh, somehow I, I got actually lost it in Hurricane Sandy. It, uh, it got, my house got wiped out. So, but um, yeah, so uh, I had the audio, but it was, it was fun. It was, th there was people calling from all different houses in 911 calls. The school called this because we were right down a block from the school. That's why I told them. I said, my partner, I said, stop, that's enough, no more rounds. So it was, uh, it was wild. You know, it's, uh, it's incredible because when you're in the academy and you're in the, we're in the same company together, it's almost, you know, like you never, you don't know what the future is going to lie. You don't know where anybody's going to wind up. And they actually say this to you, um, you're probably never going to see these people again. That's yeah. how big the job is. Yeah. That they actually say that to you. You, 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 you. There's a good chance that you're not going to see anybody that was in your company on the for the next one. Have you seen anybody? I mean, I haven't. I, I think I ran into two people. Uh, in Johnson. I, I, I've. Yeah. There's, there's been a few. Yeah. Not, you know, not as many as you would think. There's people that I, I never saw again. Like not even on social media. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's like whatever happened to um, the the the, the couple that got married while well, well, they were. It, the, the, oh. This couple that met in they were in the, in the same company, and they wound up getting married. Yes, That's a great love story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a love story. And you know, I think we did, were they um were they seeing each other in the academy or at the same time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. started right there in the academy. They wound up getting married. Um, I remember. Um, you know who I kept in touch with? Uh, Johnson. Um, Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I had him. I you know he was part of the original show that I did. Way back when, where I met Bill, where I, I pulled Bill in to do it. Yeah. Um, Rob was one of my guests on that too. 
He was he was like the big teddy bear. I love that guy. I mean, he was just a, a he was a father. He had kids at the time, and yeah, just, I wanted him to 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 graduate. And I just he was he was just a really great guy, you know. He was the other big guy in our company, and we were always team up together. So I was the guy who had to like take his punches. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Fun, I'll tell you that. We had some. Um, yeah. You know what? Where are we right now? You know what? Twenty-five we, minutes. Uh, in. I got I got a couple of commercials I want to do right now, mm -hmm. and uh, so here we go. Just give me a chance to get this thing up here. All right, check this out, folks. Uh, if you're looking to relocate to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Carol Waters of Beach City Group, Beach Realty Group, has been buying and selling property in the Myrtle Beach area for 11 years now. Carol and her husband, Rob Mahone, he's a retired FDNY firefighter and NYPD police officer, work as a team. Carol has a multi-million dollar producer for the past 10 years. They have great knowledge of all the aspects of the real estate industry. Cal is well known in the Irish community in New York. She worked in Fitzpatrick's Manhattan Hotel for over 20 years behind the stick. Originally born in the Bronx and brought up in uh, County Mayo, Ireland. Contact Carol Waters for all your real estate needs in the Myrtle Beach area. Uh, you'll see it right there is uh, Carol Waters sells mb at gmail.com. And here's the deal, man. I need we I need to get out of New York. <laughs> no, I'm serious, man. So once again, I'm gonna put it up for you folks. And you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's I don't know if I want to go through another wave of what it used to be here. I'm too old for it. So this is South Carolina is probably some place that uh I think it's at the top of my list of places I'd go. It's like the sixth borough. The, <laughs> the Beach area. Yeah, man, why not? Why not go to some place yeah. that's decent? I mean, there's no reason why. Listen, okay, people come to this country for a reason. Because there's opportunity here for a good life. Yeah. And people in this country have every right to go to some place to live where there's opportunity for a good life. And sometimes <laughs> you got to bail out. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you just got to bail out of where you grew up, where you lived, everything that you know. There's nothing worse than seeing old people like still stuck in an apartment in this horrible neighborhood just yeah. because they, they don't want to go. Like, oh, how are my kids gonna find me? They're gonna know your new address. Get out of here. <laughs> All they gotta do, just give me your new address. Yeah. You know, I'm based up in New Haven, Connecticut, my entire life, born and raised here in New Haven. Though I have some family in the city of Manhattan in the Bronx. For you know, New Haven will always be home. But if you ask me tomorrow, you know, do I want to pack up and leave? I'd say, yeah. You know, I I'm I'm just about out on the Elm City, you know. So I mean, I feel you. Could you go to any place else better than Myrtle Beach, South Carolina? I mean, think about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I would if I wasn't broke. Right now, <laughs> very, what would you say? If I wasn't broke, I would. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, whatever. Like, what'd you say? Example. You're still young. Don't worry about oh, it. Yeah. No, I'm not in a rush. I'm taking my time. But you know, when I'm ready, you're not broke. You're I'm just, you started yet. I, I've had I've had like five friends um, in the past month. That's it. Florida bound. They're gone. Yeah. South Carolina, Florida. They're all going to that area. That's it's now it's a hot spot. And I've had I've seen on a couple of things on the on the um, you know on Facebook or whatnot. And uh, you, you, they saying like Manhattan. It's a dead zone. It's so dead there. You know, yeah. it's not like what it is. You know, it's just. Well, it, I'm in the city every day. Yeah. And um, you see a difference or no? You see a big difference or. I mean, it's starting to come back. You know, we're doing shows again now. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, there's people there's people out there. It seems like there's tourists out there because, you know, they're in the club. Yeah. I did, I did three shows on Friday and three shows on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're out there. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's going to yeah. build back up again. The whole thing is just the quality of life, not even the tourism. You know what I'm saying? It's like... Yeah. You know, just seeing the same person every single day that, you know, is, they're not getting, you're not getting a, that break that you used to get from the person that terrorizes the neighborhood. Yeah. They're not gone for a day, sometimes a month, sometimes maybe six months, sometimes, because there's people that just terrorize a particular neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, on that note, I'm going to do the next commercial. You ready for this? <laughs> well, you want to terrorize your plate, you want to get some, uh, add some spice to your uh, food. Listen up, guys and gals. This is the I'm talking about the best 
hot sauce in the world. It's called Silk City Hot Sauce, and it's made in small batches using pure ingredients. They use the locally grown peppers, and that is what the foundation of every bottle of Silk City Hot Sauce is. They have so many different flavors. They got uh, Bobby Big Chipotle, Aztec Attack, uh, Badass Juice Slurp, Mango Madness, Climate Change, uh, Killer Hot, Ghost Whisper. And uh, if you haven't noticed, my face is, my jaw is coming in really nice lately. And that's because I've been on a diet. I'm getting rid of the acidity in my diet. I'm back into shape. And uh, the only spices that I have on my food are from Silk City Hot Sauce. So please vil uh, visit SilkCityHotSauce.com and you'll get 15% off uh, if you use the coupon code OTC. Copy? Use the coupon code OTC. Nice. And I want to give a, a shout out to um, a couple of people that gave the super chat. I'm a little bit behind here. I'll scroll up if you want. Uh, we have uh, a Sleeping we Beauty. Got, um, yeah. Peter Franzo, thank you so much for the super chat. Sleeping Beauty. Drugs are bad where, where I'm at. I reported drugs in a house this past Saturday, and the police told me they can't act on it. They have to wait for a team to come up for searches when they are scheduled. All right, I don't know where you live, Sleeping Beauty, but um, that sounds like a small time problem. And uh, because in the big cities over here, they're not coming either, but that's just because they've made it legal. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for your uh, your super chat of uh, $14.99. That's very nice of you. Uh, Bill Ryan from Ryan's Investigative Group uh, did a super chat for five uh, five bucks. Thank you, Bill. You're a, you're a gentleman and a scholar, and I hope to see you at my album recording. Uh, Blondie, 1025, thank you for your 499 super sticker. All right, so uh, moving right along. You know what I wanted to do? I want to show you a little something because you at some point you wind up getting into uh, narcotics, right? Yeah. And uh, so after tonight, the yeah, after the shooting, I got uh, my the the inspector, the deputy inspector in my precinct goes, "All right, Zito, I think you're ready for narcotics." I was like, "Shit!" Oh yeah, so, uh, yeah, I was in there. I did anti crime enough. I was in there for four or five years in the in the sixty the sixty second precinct. So I was like, "All right, let's go." I I I like change. I I was getting it was you know if you stay in a precinct for that long, you start getting stale. It starts you you know you, you need change when you go into these precincts. You know, and it's a good thing. Not it's a good thing to switch. So. So, no, I mean, listen, you, you did the right thing. You know, you were always looking for um, a place with more action, you know, yeah. and more uh, get involved and, and, you know, change it up a little bit, yeah. raise the stakes. And I was always looking to downplay it. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> where do we go? We do absolutely nothing. <laughs> and, you know, you're always, you know how you go to some place and you start asking the cops, like you're at a detail, yeah. you're a collar brass, and you're like, hey, where do you work? Yeah. And then they go, oh, so you start picking their brain. What are the hours? Nobody's ever asking, like, uh, they're always asking for, like, how does this fit into my life? Yeah. It's not like, it's not like how can I help the community? Like, okay, because I have my someplace baseball. I need to be off during the day, uh, you know, whatever. I need to be off in the afternoon. I need so that's what your whole life becomes. Mm. When you first come out of the academy, you're all gung ho. And then, Life starts setting in. You pick, you get, you pick up a long a wife. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a couple kids coming, and then the schedule starts changing. You start looking for different things. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, when did you meet your wife? Didn't you just celebrate something like a, an anniversary or something? Yeah, it was. I had well, it was a ten year anniversary. Um, it was. Uh, you got married late, right? Yeah, yeah. I was married once before, and um, I, I basically uh, I met my wife. I, you know, I kind of almost like stalked her. It was, uh, yeah, it was. A yeah, back then, that was that was the move back in the day. Yeah. Well, you know what? Everything is on computers and stuff. So, but the funny thing is, uh, my email address is is funny because that's how I got it when I was in narcotics. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and then I met my wife with my email address, and she looked at it, but basically, she was. It looks, it looks, it's knock, knock, boom. So it looks, it could, if you don't know anything about police work, you could just sound like, like some type of crazy sex guy. Knock, yeah. knock, boom. That's how I do it. I go, knock, knock, boom. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I used to, yeah, right, Mike? I used to, I was the Ram guy on the, uh, on the team for. That doesn't I, sound good either. I was the Ram guy. <laughs> you that. Hey, listen, 
my my email address is knock knock boom. And just so you know, I'm the Ram guy out of the group. <laughs> yeah, you can't get out of it if you say Ram guy, you're still in trouble. So, I mean, yeah, I was the Ram guy. So that's how I, I was thinking of emails back then. And actually, I didn't even have an email. And one of the guys from the teams made it up for me and got me on MySpace back in the day. Oh, back yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm taking it back with that one. Right, Mike. Yeah. So that that's when I met my 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 new wife, and I basically saw her in Atlantic City in um, in a uh, we were at a Halloween uh, party on Halloween, and basically I stalked her and I found her page somehow. I don't know. What were you dressed as? I was dressed as. Oh man, it was like a rogue FBI freaking with makeup on. I had all kinds of mohawk and shit. I was like, a, I don't know, but uh, it was one of those guys. And she was dressed as a, um, I think it was a cowgirl or something like that. And um, but I wound up meeting her with that, and uh, we basically we typed for a while on MySpace because I didn't have, I didn't I didn't know anything about it. I was like, oh, this is great. I'm typing typing on MySpace back in the day, and. So finally, I met her the first time, and she goes, you know what the first time was? I met her the first time at Atlantic City, and then the next time was New Year's Eve. She's like, what are you doing for New Year's Eve? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, why don't you come to Atlantic City? I'm here over here. I'm, I'm at one of the clubs. I run down there with a whole bunch of guys, and remember, you know, I was like, I got to meet this girl. And they're like, really? All the way to Atlantic City? We don't even know. I says, I don't care what it is. I'll pay for everybody to get in. So it was $100 a pop. So I paid for four guys. So it cost me 400 just to get them inside the club. So I wind up and I run to my girl. And now I got to I gotta say, my, my wife is nine years younger than me. So I was kind of gray. You know, and I used to die. Already. Yeah. Already. yeah, I was gray. I mean, she calls me Santa Claus right now. She calls me, <laughs> oh, she calls me like the white Mr. T, you know. So I. Uh, is that you're younger than me by a lot. Of, you're you're uh, by, what, what are you? I'm, are you four years younger than me? How the hell did you? How did you have your hair that dark? I mean, well, I, got, that, I got it over here. I got it over there. Yeah, you got a tiny bit. I'm I'm gray everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, it's just uh, listen. That does it, it suits you though. <laughs> yeah. So so basically, I wound up meeting her and um, you look like that dude on the on the dances on the thing. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> he's dancing with the girl. Well, when, when, when the tinsel falls and we met we met each other, the tinsel came down. She goes, I don't know if I was kissing tinsel or or your or your it was getting in your gray hair and stuff like that. I was like, oh god, I feel she so liked old. It, she liked it though. She liked it, you know. Yeah, she liked it. You was, guys look actually like like uh, if if you had to pick two people out that look like they should be together. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you, you pair your uh, the two of you up. You know, yeah, kind we of are, we're, we're, we're a good match. match. We're a good match. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, any questions for uh, Paul? No, I just well, I wanted a moment. Sure. <laughs> you see what I'm I might be, Mike. I'm sorry, I might be talking too much. I, I don't know. No, 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 no. no. I wanted to make it awkward for Mike. Go ahead, Mike. No, no. Well, I, I no, don't worry. On a, a, a question for in a moment, but at least on a side note, at least she didn't do to you what a girl did to me, and that's give you the wrong number on purpose. You know, that happened to be one time. I, well, that's I, what's going to pay. Don't worry about it, Mike. That that yeah. every guy growing up, I think that in, encounters a woman that they're. A hundred percent not sure if they got they got her or they they're gonna hook up with her. They give them the wrong number. It's it's an easy. I ended up texting. I ended up texting. You're gonna be pissed. She did that. You're gonna be a big star. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. But you know, but I was gonna ask uh, in regards. I've, I've I've been tinkering around with this in my head throughout our conversation. You know, dogs are such a pivotal part to police work, and not just in narcotics. You ask a bomb squad a detective. Dogs are pivotal to that work too. Uh, the relationship between canine and handler in police work and any kind of rescue work um, is very pivotal. So in regards to looking out for the safety of the dog and like making sure the dog is well kept, uh, what are the keys and how close does one become with the dog? Yeah, I should, before you start, Paul, I should uh, we, we were gonna get that, but just so the audience knows, some, uh, somehow while you were in, in narcotics, you wound up getting a dog, right? You'd be uh, canine, how did, how, well, let's That's just start from there and then we'll do Mike's question. Well, how did you end up becoming a canine guy? All right, so it was funny because I I was doing a search warrant at the time, and I and I was I I had the case going and stuff like that. We boomed the door and we got in there, and I'm just collecting all the evidence and stuff. And narcotics guys are doing a search and whatever. So all of a sudden, 
I hear something come up the stairs. So I'm right at the edge of the door in the front. I'm looking around. I hear these squeaky shoes coming up the door. And I hear, queek, queek. And I'm like, what the hell is that? It sounded like a size 9 Giorgio Brutini patent leather shoes. It winds up. It was an old friend of mine. It was a lieutenant from he was a he was a sergeant back in the day that worked midnights for me, and he become a lieutenant, and he got the job as lieutenant for canine narcotics. So while I finished the search warrant, he's coming up to me and he goes, He sounds like Joe Pesci, too. You gotta look at him. And he's like, Hey, where's Zito? Is he around here? And I'm like, Oh, I says, Holy sh what's up, Jimmy? What's going on? He's like, Are you done here? I says, yeah, I'm, I'm almost finished. We're almost finished with the search warrant. He goes, nah, are you done with narcotics? You done with the K uh, this? Uh, you come with me. You come with canine. I was like, holy crap. Because, you know, you do, you start narcotics and, I mean, it's it's a lot of work. You got CIs. You got cases that they throw on your desk every five minutes. And then basically, you know, you, you got to keep working and do going out with your team and, and hustling. You get 12, 13 piles a night. I would sometimes I would. My wife told me you weren't home for like two days straight sometimes. But in uh, cana and narcotics, I got in and he pulled me in there. So when I got into narcotics, you they basically set you up where you have to test out the dogs. The guy from your unit, he's the, he's like the trainer. He gets the dogs from the uh, the police department. He sends them out. He sends out requests from Arkansas, all over Texas, California, and they bring the dogs in. So now, Mike, when you bring the dogs in, you have to test them out to see if they would wash out. So washing out the dogs was a big part because sometimes the dogs would hit on certain spots. Sometimes one of the, the canines won't search. Sometimes they were too aggressive. Um, sometimes they were very, they had either injuries or something like that, but you know, mo most of the time they were good, but you had to pick out the right one. And I wound up picking out this female, uh, she was a sable shepherd and she was just the right size. She was about 65 pounds because when you get into narcotics and you go through, um, those little cracks and searches and stuff like that, you can't have any big dogs. You can't have a giant looking crazy. See that picture was from, uh, there was a, one of my trainers had a Belgian Malinois. They are hyper, super strong, crazy dogs, and they are very good searchers if they're not. Now, he was he was uh, search and rescue. He was uh, he, he had attack in him, uh, bite. Um, he had cadaver in him. So, you know, but my dog just had search and rescue and narcotics trained. So when you get the dog. Is that your dog? Yeah, that's Taz, yeah. Yeah, I got her when she was about, I think she was about two when I got her. So you get them pre-trained from the trainers, and then we have to retrain them with our dog uh, with our, in, in our uh, facilities. So that one we had, that picture right there, we hit, uh, we hit a, I was working with the uh, DETF, and they had a hint that this truck was, this florist truck was hitting a big load. So we had the dog go right up on a plank and smell the inside. And my dog was, uh, there's passive aggressive, and then there's the ones that just stay there and they look up at you, that they, they tell you that, that they hit. So my dog would scratch, she was an aggressive dog. So basically she hit on that dog, boom, they hit up. It was like, I think we had about 80 boxes filled with pillowcases filled with weed in it. So it was a, it was a nice hit on that one. But basically Mike, what, what the dog, when they when you get them, they get pre-trained and then you have to really get to know the dog because the dog looks up at you. He doesn't work with anybody else. He didn't really mend with my children. My children, he was very, very careful with my children, very calm. But he was always looking up to me because I was the handler. I was him. He, we were partners. And that's how the dog should be. You know what I mean? So with, with your questions, it's how close you should be with the dog. Yeah, guys are very close. I mean, ESU guys were not right next to us in the Brooklyn Army Terminal. And you guys have, I mean, these are attack dogs. And if you send your dog out to bite, you better make sure you know how to get your dog off that bite because they could do major damage. So oh, yeah. my dog was, yeah, my dog was just narcotics and that's all. I didn't want her to do anything else. I didn't want no bite, no nothing in her. And she was very, very good. I really, I really commend her. I mean, we, we trained very hard and we did a lot of training with my trainers and um, she did a very, very good job. And I, and I helped a lot of narcotic guys out because sometimes in those search warrants, they can't find those drugs and when they saw me, they were like, Z, you got it. You got to find this. And sure as shit, it'd be in floorboards. It would be stuck in. I had one that was stuck in a porno 
And they, it, it was like, you know, yeah, it was like five, five or six bags of uh, heroin or something like that. You know what I mean? So simple stuff. But I mean, I could tell you a million spots where she hit, but it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a great, great year. And I give a shout out to my, uh, my old Lieutenant, uh, Jimmy Argenziano. He pulled me out of narcotics, which was, you know, you start getting stale in there. And, um, and even though I wasn't there for a long time, three, four years, but, um, the unit changed my life and enjoyed it, but it was a, it was a very good learning experience. And, and it's some, it's one of the hidden kept units. You know, I had guys when I was ready to retire, they were, I had dozens of guys from narcotics going, cause you have to have narcotic um, um, uh, work behind you to try and get into that unit, you know, and you gotta be, a, you have to have a detective shield. So that was, uh, that was a big part of it. And I got guys, please, you gotta get me in. You gotta get me in. And I was trying to get guys in, but you know, it's up to Lieutenant who he thinks that he wants to get into the unit. So, but um, it, it worked out. It was a, it was an unbelievable unit. Awesome. Amazing. Yeah. 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 See, I did well, Mark. You tried to put me on the spot, but I survived. <laughs> yeah, you, did good. you did good. That was a good question. I, mean, I, I can go off forever with these things. I hadn't, I hadn't brought it up yet, but uh, that was, I was interested about the dog. So the dog comes home with you and stuff like that. And he's yeah. basically living with you. Yeah, basically, the dog comes home with me. So now you make sure you're going through all the, all these apartments and all these houses. And I was doing searches in. I had to hop my dog up, which is hopping, which is. You had to climb up ladders, and I was going through uh, uh, in in attics. I had basements that were filled with rats. I had glue traps. My dog went to the hospital about five or six times for glue traps mm -hmm. stuck on it because once they get them on there, they have to get removed from doctors from the from the animal hospital. And I was in an animal hospital about fifty times in my in my time there, getting these glue traps off my dog. And my dog got actually hurt very bad once. Um, she was, uh, we were in the Bronx and we were doing a search warrant and I was waiting for the team to get out. And, uh, it was kind of on my part and the dog, uh, I was, I was throwing a stick and the dog got it lodged in its throat and I have to had the dog rush to the emergency room. She was actually bleeding out. It got so stuck in her esophagus. She was almost bleeding out. So I had, uh, it, uh, a highway cop escort me to, to, um, to the animal hospital in Manhattan and they didn't know if the dog was going to live or not, but she was out for like a, a like two weeks, which had about thirty stitches down her throat and stuff like that. You were playing with her? What's that? You were playing with her? Yeah, you, you know what they they tell you never to throw. I, you know what I'd have my I had usually have toys on you where you throw or you work with the dog and you have fun with the just to get her get her moving. You know, and you get it ready to to go into the search warrant. And um, I wound up throwing a stick, and the stick landed in the dirt. And she ran full speed. And it got caught all the way up in her throat. So, oh, but uh, yeah. And th let me tell you something. The dog. You have to watch out for your dog because you go into areas. I had dogs. I had cats. Two cats going. The, the cats were underneath the bed, underneath the bunk bed, and my dog went for a sniff, and they attacked her. I mean, I never seen so much hair and so much screaming <laughs> from cats in my life. I was like, holy shit! Is my dog gonna get cut up and stuff? You know, and that was another trip to the hospital because she got cut up and one of them bit her ear and stuff like that. So, you know, it's just not, you know, you go in for a nice little search and you find a job. No, there's all kinds of shit that's going to happen. I mean, second, you know, Garfield comes out at you. Yeah, right. Garfield is <laughs> right. Yeah. Two good, two brothers that don't want no part of dogs being in their house. You know, well, so think about it. yeah, you're bringing a strange dog in there yeah. and there's animals already living in there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and a dog. Living around those, they're, obviously they're going to be territorial. Like I, I don't even know if they used to have them trained or whatever. They, they some, some. I mean, you, you don't think you, about that kind of stuff. But that's that's a that's a major situation there. Yeah, I mean, once your dog is getting attacked by cats and stuff like that, I mean, you'd think your cats, whatever. But you, as a handler, you don't want your dog getting touched by anything. You know, you got to keep that dog very clean. If you're bringing it home. You got fleas, you got bed bugs, you got rats, you got cats, you got other dogs. I have, I was going to apartments where they had pit bulls uh, bigger than gorillas in there. And I was like, dude, I am not bringing my dog unless those things are secured. I used to get ESU in there. So it was it was a lot. You know, when you get your dog, when you have your dog with you, you want him to be safe just as much as you because that dog could die at any time, anything. You know, somebody could pop out and and, and blast the dog. You know what I mean? It's, it's that simple. I, we've had guys... I've had guys that my dog found in closets with firearms on them and stuff like that. And um, it was, it was a lot, but you know, as you, 
as you get onto this unit, you basically address all the situations that you know you might get into. So it was, um, you know, it was something where I always had to keep a heads up on her. And she's always looking up at me going, am I doing a good job? Am I doing a good job? And, you know, I used to, you know, I used to help the dog. I used to, and I used to treat her very well. She was a great, great dog. Dogs, uh, it's so beautiful. Dogs are the best. And uh, oh. it, it, I, it, it bothers me that, you know, that they, they could get hurt like that. by like, Even if it's by like, you know, like you said, by cats jumping out. It's yeah. just so and, and, and you'd be like, you know, you'd watch them. You watch, You couldn't do anything because they would, I mean, it looked like, you know, something in a cartoon would be spinning around. You know, the dog would be ripping, won't be biting her ass and won't be biting their ears in the face. And she couldn't, you know, yelping and screaming. And, you know, I, I, what am I going to do? Trying to, you know, you can't, grab, these these cats will rip you apart too. You know what I mean? So <laughs> and you're not going to pull out your piece and stop blasting away, you know, so. No, no, of course not. So I do, uh, I do want to, let me ask a, another question, Mark, if you don't mind. Yeah, go um, ahead. I just wanted to ask, Paul, you know, you mentioned your dog being a search and rescue dog. Dogs were uh, of critical importance at Ground Zero. Uh, were any dogs from uh, the canine narcotics unit used at Ground Zero, to your knowledge, at Ground Zero? Um, not, not of my knowledge. I don't, I don't think they would use, they wouldn't pull us in, um, for something like that. I mean, uh, they always, anything, some certain situations like that bomb, or if there was a situation where it was a burglary or a robbery and there was somebody pinned or something like that, they would always, always call like ESU. Um, uh, the ESU dogs will come in. Uh, they always had the bloodhounds for, uh, for, for search and rescue and stuff like that. So, but um, it, it was it was it was never we were never used for anything with nine eleven. So, okay, yeah. So uh, how did you end? Up, how did the the career end up there? How long did you keep the dog for? Uh, I had her. I had Taz for about about six years. Uh, actually, wow. seven years. That's a long so, time. Yeah, yeah. So Ooh, uh, that's a long time. Yeah, that's I mean. I almost lost her in Hurricane Sandy. That was a that was a big you thing. Tell, you were telling me about that. That's an incredible story. Tell me about that. Yeah. What so so you basically, were, you were in Staten Island, right? For, yes. And At the time, I lived in Staten Island, and uh, you know, we had the take home car and stuff like that, and I had the the dog cage. When uh, in the beginning, when when we, they when they gave us the uh, the take home trucks, they were brand new Tahoes, and you were like, you were macking a, a a crazy Tahoe with tinted windows. You know what I mean? So it was really nice, and they had the slip-in cage. It was perfect. It was customized, everything. But then all oh, the upper up, upper uh, upper echelons go like this. Yeah, you know what? I don't think these units need uh, brand-new Tahoes. I think we need to take them. So they used to take all our Tahoes, and they gave us the soccer vans. So, so we had, had a little soccer van. Yeah, they had, like, little minivans. So now, you know, now you're rolling up to areas where, you know, you know, there's crowds around knowing that there's a big arrest going on with the narcotic teams. And instead of rolling up with a macked out Tahoe, you're rolling up with a free for a free, like a like a, <laughs> like, a, like, a, like a mom with six kids coming out of the back playing soccer. You know what I mean? But but whatever. Anyway, um, but in, in certain situations, uh, that happened to me uh, when Hurricane Sandy hit. I um, I had the dog at home, and and basically I knew it was coming. I lived off the water in Tottenville which was a block into the water. So my house was here. I had about five houses, and then I had the, the whole water in the beach. So that that hit us really hard. We were like, it actually angled right into us in, in my area in Staten Island. So it was like a pathway to for the, big, for the big wave to come in, the surge. And at the time, I knew it was it was coming, but I didn't know that it was as bad. They said last, the, the hurricane before that, uh, was bad, and I had to uh, tack down all my furniture in the backyard and stuff like that. I actually tied it up to my house, and I only got about four about uh, four inches of water in my basement. And this one, when it came, it was it was insane. It was it came like a a, a surge. I had two people actually die on my block, uh, a father mm -hmm. and a daughter. And um, but in that instance, um, I had my take home radio, and when the water came and it surged, it ripped the houses apart. It's it spun the houses around. It smacked in my whole front porch got wiped out by a house, and you could hear it was like ninety mile an hour winds. I mean, there's a hundred stories, thousand stories you could hear about 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 Hurricane Sandy. But for me, you know, I, I was in a you know the shootout and stuff like that. I, I would rather be in like ten shootouts than see what happened than than this happened to me because 
it was it was me, my wife, and my wife was pregnant at the time, and it was my two year old, and we had to get up to the second floor because the water rose so fast that it went through the basement and it sucked everything up into my second floor and it went into the, the whole first floor. And then we had to go up into the second floor and I only had a window outside to see what was going on. It was pitch black. So at the time I had the dog with me. So I had to bring the dog upstairs with me, my wife and my kid. And um, so now I put it over the radio and I, and I had my radio with me and I said, Central, be advised, this is a retired uh, uh, off-duty detective. I need a, a water rescue forthwith. She puts over, I put over the address and everything. Uh, she says, uh, be advised, no FD can get down to your location. My friend, who was a 30-year uh, friend of mine that lived around the block with me, and his name is, uh, uh, it was Officer Danny Ricciardi, and he worked out of the 123 precinct, which was, wasn't too far from me. And at the time, he heard my voice, and he was like, Z, is that you? And I'm like, Dan, I got to get out of here. Dan, the, the, you know, the houses are coming down over here. So what he did was, don't worry, we're coming. That was the only thing. That was the last response I heard. And um, when they got to three blocks away from my house, the, war, the surge was like three feet of water. The FD guys, not to say anything, but they says, if you go down there, I mean, they were looking out for the cops too. They says, if you go down there, you might get killed. It's, it's that bad. So they came on a boat. So they came on a boat and basically they came down the block as far as they can. The winds were so bad, they got knocked off the boat. They came up to my house. My 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 old, my few, uh, friend, Danny, swam up to my railings and basically pulled himself over. And because I had a high porch and he basically says, he says, Z, we got to get out of here right now. And um I had a, there was a captain with him, Captain um, Bocchino, and he landed his guys to do a, uh, I think it was like six guys that did a, like a line. So we wrapped my son up in a blanket. I grabbed my wife who was pregnant at the time. She was like seven months pregnant. And I threw my guns and whatever thing in the backpack. And we jumped off the porch and we started swimming out, out of the water uh, through houses, through, we went over, we went over actually over uh, roofs, cars. I had a restaurant that was around the block for me. All the furniture and everything was in the middle. Of, there was trees down. There was everything in the middle. So it was very tough to get out of there. And finally, he got us out of there. They, we, got us, we got us like two blocks away. And you could finally, you know, hold on to the cars and walk out. And from there, we got out. They did the rescue. And then I go, and I'm going, shit, I got to go back for the fucking dog. I cannot leave her there. If that house comes down, I will feel bad. I would feel like like the worst person. So my wife's like, you can't go back there. You can't go back. I says, I got to go back to the dog. He's my partner. So what I did was I went back, I went back with a bunch of guys, but they couldn't get to my area because there were so many trees. It was so afraid that I had to get through trees to get to the, to get to the house. I mean, they used big giant bulldozers to get to, uh, to clean out the block when the water subsided. That's how much debris was on the, was on the block. So I got the dog and the, the hardest part for me was holding the dog because the dog, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think she could have swam out of there because it was, it was like actually waves. So I had to hold her up and swim with her and get her to certain spots where I had to climb onto roofs. And, um, I actually put a harness on her to, to, to make sure I could grab her by the waist and I was just trying to hop her up and pull her up on certain roofs, over cars, over trees, uh, through all, all kinds of furniture. It was like, it was insane. So I finally got her out of there. And uh, it was like one of the craziest nights. I, my wife was, I told my wife, she goes, are we going to die? I says, I don't know. I says, we, we might die in this. This is, this is the worst I've ever seen it. So it was a, it was a crazy, crazy experience. And, you know, Thank God I got the dog out of there too, because if I would have left her, you know, it's just like leaving your baby behind. You know, that's how close we were. So I'm telling you, when you're telling that story, I'm glad you guys are okay. I, I legit had chills running down my spine as you were telling that story. I can't even imagine. I'm so sorry that happened. Yeah. yeah. You know what? You earned it, man. You got a 12 step woman that uh, gave us a 999 super chat on that. So uh, that was, <laughs> that was a phenomenal. You had me, uh, Tim, Tim Acosta gave us a $10 super chat. Oh, nice. Uh, man, what a story. 12-step woman, $1.99 stupid sticker. 
Uh, so thank you, everybody who's tuning in, man. That was a riveting story because the thing is, you know, you never you, obviously you can't experience what it what it's like to be in that type of peril if you're not in that area. We hear stories about you know different parts of the country where this kind of stuff is coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, everybody has to deal with something. You know what I'm saying? It's it's kind of hard to find the perfect place in this country where there's no tornadoes, there's no hurricane season, you know, there's uh, no winter, you know, where it's like Eden, you know, and every yeah. everybody has to deal with something. Unfortunately, we have to deal with winter here and you had to deal with <laughs> a hurricane. Yeah, yeah I, that was my first. I mean, Irene down here in the tri-state, we all live in the tri-state area, of course, yeah. for now until Mark moves out to Carolina. But, you know, down here in, in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, um, uh, we have a big tree in front of my in front of my house, and my grandfather, who was seventy five at the time, he came and stayed with us for safety purposes. And I remember it's kind of like that line in Enter Sandman by Metallica: "Sleep with one eye open." And so <laughs> I was that entire night because I heard the trees coming down the street, and I just kept wondering, "Is that tree out front going to come down?" It was, you know, it pales in comparison to what you went through. But yeah, that was by far yeah, but, the scariest yeah, but thing. Yeah, you know Mike, still, you still think about in the back of your mind and you, the, you know, that's, that's the hurricane. And so that could definitely happen. You know, they, they, they say like, you know, you get up to 85, 90 mile an hour winds, that tree could, that tree could have uh, to accidentally just, you know, topped over onto the house and stuff like that. So that's how it was. It was like every five minutes I was wondering, is the house going to go down? You know, is this tree going to collapse onto mine? Is there another house that's going to crash into my house? You know what I mean? So I mean, what happened after that? I mean, did you get to, get to move back into that house? Or no, that well, no, I actually, uh, actually, because it, it moved the foundation in the house. So it was, uh, you could, I had a, I have, I have a photo of it, but it's tilted sideways. The, the whole inside of the house was demolished. The, uh, the, the whole first floor, all the floorboards were all watered up and everything. And, um, you just, you know what? I, I've been on that block for it was a, it was a quite a few years. I was on that block for about six or seven years, and basically every hurricane, I got to shit my pants and worry if. And I just put a, a brand new in-ground pool in there, and I got to worry if there's going to be another hurricane that's going to come and the water is going to come up um, towards my house and, and destroy the block again. So my wife was like, "You know what? I'm not. We ain't doing this again. We're out of here." So we wind up uh, we wind up moving to another house. And, to the Jersey Shore, uh, right? What's that? <laughs> you wind up moving to the Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, we wind up moving to another house. Yeah, right? We just moved to another shore. We we moved to another water, shore right? Yeah. So seriously, how far away are you from the water right now? No, I'm far. No, I'm far. Really? I'm, I'm in I'm in Marlboro. So Marlboro is like a um right, more of, uh, away from it's about it's about forty minutes away from water. So I'm good. You know, I don't want to move anywhere near water anymore. That's it. I'm done. You know, <laughs> Aaron Rodriguez. Uh, uh, thank you, Aaron Rodriguez, for uh, a 999 super chat. I think we did good tonight. I mean, listen, Bill usually runs his whole show, and he does a phenomenal job doing it. Um, I never realized how much hard work it is, but it, <laughs> you got to really like pay attention to everything that's going on here. Yeah. And uh, which brings up to this, I, I, I don't, I want to make sure I don't forget this. Um, for those of us who don't know, you know, the fans that are tuning in tonight, I am recording an album. The album, uh, the current working title is called The Bangers. I've been doing this comedy thing for uh, over 20 years. I have jokes that are killers. I'm putting them on all on the first album, and uh, it's going to be called The Bangers. We're recording it at the New York Comedy Club on 4th Street. Uh, we have two shows, 7 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. on Sunday, April 25th. Um, you can get tickets at newyorkcomedyclub.com. And uh, it's if you put the coupon code in Mark with a K, you'll get uh, you'll get the tickets for $10. They're $25 at the door, but uh, they're only $10. And uh, this album that you're going to, I'm going to be recording is going to be found on Sirius. It's going to be found on Spotify. When you're driving in your car, you're going to have to listen to my jokes. Uh, it's going to be great, though. I guarantee you, man. It's funny because, you know, you take such a long break. And I really, I felt rusty and I was, um, cause this is a deal that I had to record this album before the Corona. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when everything started happening, we kept rescheduling. So now, okay, we're going to do it. And now it's also too, you got to work out a lot. And, um, I finally, I'm finally starting to feel like, all right, I'm going to slap the shit out of these people. That's it, man. <laughs> if you show up, 
Hey, Mark, I was wondering if you're going to grow your hair like there was in that picture. That hair is exciting, brother. Which one is that? Oh, your that hair. one? That hair was yeah. exciting. Oh, love it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that was like it kind of sort of it, – it, it wound up growing out a lot more. Like, And then when it fell down here, it was good. Yeah. But you know what it is? You get like one good day out of the month. <laughs> you know, yeah, the other the rest of the month, I, the rest of the days, I look like J Benjamin Franklin. I got to wear a hat. Like the thing is just like because uh, I got curly hair. Like, you know, there's a lot of work. This the way we rock right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's it's perfect. You know, it's a little bit of touch up in the front. I blow dry the front a little bit, and we're ready to go. Yep, I got you. You know what I'm saying? And you know what I want to do? I want to do a special thing because to, for our sponsors that you know bother to. Um, I just want to give them one last thing. So um, I want to bring it up one more time. If you're thinking about moving out of New York and South Carolina, Myrtle Beach area, is something that's been uh, in your head a possibility. You could do no better than going with uh, Carol Waters. She's got uh, the Beach Realty Group, and she's been selling property over there for 11 years. Uh, both her and her husband, uh, who is a retired FDNY firefighter, work together. He was also on the NYPD. And uh, to me, I don't know if you could do any better than moving over there to Myrtle Beach right now. That's the place to go. So check that out. It's a Carol Waters Sells MB at gmail.com. And don't forget about um, Silk City Hot Sauce. Yeah. Because they've been with us from the beginning and they have a great product. And Paul, whatever happened to the dog? Uh, yeah. At the end, uh, you know, I had it for about uh, so it was uh, eight years, and basically at the end, you know, her legs and everything started going. She had when I had her, when I got her, I found out she had Lyme disease. Oh, um, so uh, basically, the dog's uh, joints and everything were in bad shape, and she was just uh, losing it at the end. And I felt so bad for her, the way she was, and. Her, her, her life and stuff like that. So um, I tell you, I, 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 when I put her down and I brought her to uh, the last meal, I gave her a big steak and I gave her ice cream and stuff like that. I mean, she would have shit all over the house if I, you know, if, if, if I, if, if, <laughs> and, um, yeah, she would she would have destroyed the house, but I gave her the biggest uh, meal she could possibly want. And when I took her to uh, the vet to put it down, it was like, I, I've never went through something like that. I cried for an hour straight. A grown man would cry for an hour straight. The, actually, the doctor came back in. He goes, you, oh, sh all right, I'll let you, don't worry about it. Stay whatever, <laughs> as long as you want. I was crying, hugged up. I had the dog on top of me. It was just, you know, the tongue was hanging out. But, uh, but yeah, she was, uh, and my, everybody, you know, everybody that knew the dog, they miss her. You know, the, my wife, my kids and stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it, she was a great, great dog. And they become uh, family. Yeah, it becomes right, Mike. It comes very it, exactly. That's what it is. It's family. I used to take the dog out for walks with the kids and stuff like that. And, but it, it definitely becomes a part of your life. And she's a big, she was a big part of my life. I'll never forget her. You know what, what I want to do with, to tie the bow on this, uh, because we are over an hour right now. I just want to go back to where we met in the academy and how we bonded right off the bat. And we, we, we shared a common thing back then. We used to smoke cigarettes. And this might sound insane to uh, people that are in the academy now or who have graduated from the police academy recently in College Point. But um, we, on our breaks, we used to smoke cigarettes in the bathroom there. Yeah. Somebody would look out and uh, somebody would, what do we call them? We would have just lookouts, and we would have. What do we call the cigarettes, though? Fonts. <laughs> I don't know. I, what actually, I used to say, "Hey, Mark, you got a font? The font <laughs> up right in the bathroom." And we used to go inside the stalls, close the door, and we'd have somebody assigned to the door. I mean, if you got caught in the academy smoking cigarettes, you you're done. You fuck. They can fucking throw you out. You know what I mean? But, but we, did, we did it every day. Every day. We every smoked. day. You know what? Like, that was it. Way. You could smoke in the restaurants. You could smoke here. You could smoke there, and everything like that. But and we weren't we weren't really allowed to smoke. Even in restaurants, they would look for us, right? Oh, forget it. I mean, we had an ICO once. This guy was like Steve Austin. I mean, the Bionic <laughs> Man. He looked like Steve Austin. He had this suit on. It was taped. It was mint. This guy was big. And one day, I was, I, I I talked to you, and I was like, "Hey, dude, let's go. Let's go eat something. Where you want to go?" I says, let's go to the Oriental place around the block. We're going there. They got a back place. 
There's there's a there's a seats in the back. This nobody will find us. We can smoke. It'll be great. So he's like, ah, right, good, nice. So we go back there. We order a meal with like stuff. I'm like, dude, give me a font. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we used to light up, and sure as shit, anything. This guy, I think he was a lieutenant or sergeant, Sergeant Reese. This guy had a bionic eye. He came up to the fucking window, and it was, it, it, and the and the window was tinted of the the Oriental restaurant. He came up to this, and he put his eye up to the window, and he was like, and you heard like he lost it, and he, he looked at us, and I was like, he's got us, and he was like. Fuck, he's got us. And he, he goes, like, get over here, you two. And we were behind like a paper mache, you know that, those paper mache things? We had everything. We had it all cover. We were, we were good. This guy caught us, and we were like, that's uh, he's got us, man. And he used to take the demerit cards from us. He was good, this guy. He was sharp as hell. Uh -huh. sharp, man. <laughs> the star cards, right? Oh, yeah, the star card, yeah. Oh, man. We're, we're, we're at a... Uh... We're at eight. We we've been at this for an hour and ten minutes. But before, uh, I I want to make sure that Mike, because I know you you work your way through here. You probably didn't have uh, the opportunity to ask all the questions that you wanted to ask. But if you could close out with something, you know what I'm saying. The best question that you got left. What, hip hop, oh, wow. hip hop, right here. Uh, all right, I got to take it home. What can I come up with? Well, I guess you know. There's a lot of dangerous jobs that you respond to over the course of a career in the fire department or in the police department in any city, but especially in a city like New York. But this is one question I always conclude with on my show, and that is, can you recall the funniest job you ever responded to? <laughs> Again, Mike, I'm going to get you a good one. Are you ready? Yes. I'm going to give it to you because this was a canine job. All right. Mm -hmm. You would think, I mean, some, some were funny and some were great, but bringing it back. I had to go to a crime scene with the dog because it was a drug related crime scene. So it was a small little apartment on the side of a house. And guess who winds up showing up? It was like, I think it was the chief of narcotics. I think he was in the VO and he basically came in and I had crime scene. I had the detectives. I had the chief of narcotics there. I had another chief there. So there was, there was, I had to be on my shit. You know what I mean? So I had to like this, my dog was ready to go. I got her all psyched up. But I didn't know what was psych what was what was gurgling in her stomach. You know what I'm getting at? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Because when yeah. I got her in that fucking apartment, there was a dead body not three feet away from me. And she took a diarrhea shit from the bedroom to the kitchen to the bathroom. <laughs> so I had she shit all over the whole crime scene. Now everybody's got to do their work in there. This was like in the beginning, and she's shitting the whole crime scene. And I looked at myself. I'm going, jeez, what the? F really? This is the this is the one place you got to shit your brains out in. <laughs> and and, and the, all the the higher ups are looking at me, going, "All right, we're uh, we're out of here. All right, we're out of here." And I'm like, "I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, I I apologize. I'm I'm so sorry." I didn't, I don't know what the, the dog. I don't. I, I'm looking at the dog. I'm like, you stupid. Uh, so it was one of those things. But that was that was pretty much the most funniest, embarrassing thing I've ever went through with the dog or whatever. But that was it, man. That was it, Mike. That's, that's a, the, you know what's good about the way you tell the stories is that because you could tell that you guys uh, with the dog, you had a really good relationship. It wasn't yeah. just. Um, you're not making believe, you know. There were some good days, and then some yeah. times, where, you know, she was, a, she could be a little annoying the way anybody yeah. you were involved in a relationship with could be. Yeah. You know, the door could be off sometimes. The door could be off, and she sometimes she doesn't want to search. She doesn't want to work. You know what I mean? But you, you, you as a handler have to get your dog psyched up and ready to to work because every job is important. Every every search warrant is important because you know you could be helping out the the the, the, the lead narcotic detective on the case. And if he doesn't find drugs, you know, the case goes pretty much out the window. And these guys, these dealers and stuff, these other guys, they, they can hide these drugs so far high up and so far low that you'll never find them. They got them wrapped in, they got them hot mustard. They got them wrapped in coffee. They got them wrapped in detergent, in coffee grinds, and wrapped up in a box, double sealed. But guess what? My dog can find it. So that's what, that's what the, you know, the, we were all about. You know what I mean? They were the last nice. resort to help out the, the teams. Whoa. Hey, folks, if you enjoyed tonight's episode, 
uh, we'd appreciate it if you, uh, you consider joining our Patreon, where you'll find exclusive entertainment uh, from Bill Cannon, my host, and myself. Bill does a true crime show. He just had uh, Tommy Dades on, an incredible detective who's written a book, as well as, uh, I, I'm pretty sure the name is Larry Mazza? Mazza. Yes. Okay, yeah, who was, you know, he was a Colombo crime family you know, made guy, and it's an incredible episode, and he does a lot of those incredible episodes, man. He's really kicking ass in that, and those are uh, exclusive on Patreon. I do, um, uh, I tell stories on there. <laughs> I do my uh, story time with Mark DeMeo, and I also do one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, and we'd appreciate it if you consider joining our Patreon. And also, too, if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our uh, YouTube page. It's Police Off the Cuff on YouTube. Uh, what can I say, man? Tonight's been a great episode. Uh, Paul, I know you were nervous going in, um, but you did phenomenal, man. Thanks, brother. I mean, 29 years I haven't seen you. I mean, you're like, you're, I mean, it's like I see, it's like me and you running the academy with those tight ass shorts on in front of me. You know what I mean? Those shorts are tight, man. You know, they were like the old basketball shorts that <laughs> yeah. they used to wear. Yeah, the white stripe on them, but your quads were extremely exploding out of them. You know, they were, they were just, you, you were, you were, you had a good time. I just I, want everybody to know in the audience that, you know, my, Mark was was an extremely uh, well put together uh, gentleman when he was in the academy. But if you ask him what's in his wallet, he's got a picture of himself when he's bodybuilding. <laughs> he's got a picture of him with a double bicep pose on stage. And I says, if you ever get in trouble, Mark, just pull out that picture, buddy. <laughs> you know, it's funny, that was before social media, where you had to carry your own uh, promotional a promotional picture along with you before oh, you. My God. I mean, it's I the edge. Your body was insane, brother. I'm telling you, it was. It was That's so nice of you to say that, man. And uh, you got a beautiful family. Thank I'm you. so happy that you're doing well. What are you doing now? Oh God, I'm playing dad over here. You know what I mean? My wife's a school teacher. She works in Staten Island. So, uh, so basically, you know, the kids come home off the bus, and I got to take care of everybody. You know, one day when these kids get older, maybe I can go back to work or whatever. But. Um, but for now, I'm just, you know, I'm living a life out here. It's very peaceful, very quiet, very yeah, nice. You're in, a, you're, you're in a good spot right there. You're You've earned it. Yeah. You've earned it. Yeah. Hey, Mike, what do you have coming up? Oh, okay. So a couple, you know, on my podcast, it's not exclusively law enforcement. As Mark said, it is called Mike in New Haven, M-I-C apostrophe D in New Haven. It's a wordplay of my old WFAN call-in name, which is Mike in New Haven. Uh, so on the sports side, Howard Beck, who's a writer for Sports Illustrated, uh, he'll be coming up April 19th and April 27th. I have a mini series within the podcast called Tales from the Boom Room, in which I chronicle members of the uh, retired members of the NYPD's uh, arson and explosion squad, as well as the bomb squad. Wow. I just had Don Sadawi on, and I'm going to be having retired first grade detective Paul Pericone on, who was in the bomb squad for 18 years and was also a former ESU cop. So uh, exciting stuff coming up on the show. Very nice. Okay, on Thursday, I'm going to be uh, my co host on Thursday is going to be Irma Rivera. We got a surprise guest for you stopping in. Um, it's going to be another excellent show. Uh, you know what? Listen, Bill does a lot of work here, man. I got <laughs> Mark, yeah. you did good tonight, buddy. You, you held it down. It was. I mean, listen, I, I did. I, I agree. Years, I think we were on point a little bit. Yeah. I just want to make sure that uh, before we go, we, we gave a shout out to everybody. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned Twelve Step Woman uh, earlier, but um, thanks for CPD USMC uh, Jose G uh, Gomez retired from chicago detective checking in thank you for checking in by the way um thank you for listening to everybody that paid attention tonight and, and, and joined the live chat uh princess mitch great job um uh, thank you that's very nice of you to say that um so we got one more episode we're doing on thursday and uh and bill bill will be back next week and uh what can i say man thank you paul no it's problem. great seeing you again uh, it is, buddy, and I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come see you with your uh, your gigs. Believe you me, I heard you, uh, when you get that gig in Staten Island, I'm definitely gonna swing. Yeah, by. yeah I'm gonna be in Jersey too, so you don't even okay. have to flip all the way to Staten Island. Yeah. But and Mike, Mike, thank you so much for sitting in. Yeah, thanks, no problem. It was an honor. It was my pleasure. You great did a job. great job, Mike. job, Mike. Great thank job. Thank you. Thank and you. For everybody who uh, was with us tonight, I hope I, I found you, Mich uh, Michelina Serino, uh, at Paul. I can't imagine what it was like, yikes. So uh, yeah, I think she's going back to the poo-poo story. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for tuning in, folks. And uh, make sure you tune in 7, uh, 7 p.m. on Thursday night for me and Irma and a surprise guest. Um, it's going to be great again. And thank you, guys. All the best to you. <laughs>